of solution perspectives on sustainable and inclusive transport mobilities. Um, and we're particularly trying to think in this, um, this session, these set of sessions about thinking about new pathways and fresh horizons, not so much to only identify the problems of um, low income and disadvantaged communities in terms of transport and mobilities and access, but also to try and come up with some ideas about co-designed and co-produced solutions to that. Um, so uh, I'm just going to sort of uh, wait a couple of minutes until the participation stabilizes a little bit. We are recording all of the sessions. We won't be re releasing the recordings and the slides until the end of the sessions. Um, we do have a chat function and a Q&A function within Zoom at the bottom of your screen. So if at any point you do want to um, put a question in the chat or make an observation, that is absolutely fine. We don't have cameras and speakers on because um, we're not able to handle that um, within the, the program that we've got on Zoom. And so this, without any further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Tanu Priya Yuteng, who is going to chair the session and it's focusing on spatial planning and integrated transport development, particularly in India and um, Bangladesh. So without any uh, further ado, Tanu, I'm going to stop sharing and pass over to you. Thanks, Karen. And um, with that, I'll invite uh, Professor Asanul Kabir from uh, Kulna University. He's uh, working with the Department of Urban and Rural Planning. And uh, he's going to give us a very interesting perspective on how development planning and policy, uh, different policies link to urban planning strategies and or how importantly they don't link. So Professor Arsenal, please. Thank you. Let me see. Can you see my screen? Yes. OK. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, today I want to talk about uh, economic planning and spatial planning, because I see that if uh, these two planning approach that is very well practiced in Bangladesh and there's a little bit of disjoint relation, so they are not very well integrated. So as a result, uh, it has impact on uh, you know, the implementation of different projects, uh, especially for the poor, and the small uh, cities and the villages. So I thought that's very important area to look into if we want to really get success in implementing the sustainable transport solution for the small communities. So before I get going, I'll just uh, give you an uh, overview of what I'm going to talk. So I'll just give you an idea that how the cities are, uh, you know, the spread across the geography and then development policy and what are the commitments and how the targets are translated into the planning thing. So we have international commitment, political commitment and policy commitment and, and, and different uh, other type of commitments and all these commitments that you translate into economic planning and special planning. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes they are not integrated. In many cases, they are not integrated due to the way they are practiced in the country. So, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, that I want to focus that we need to work on this area in in the planning. So if you look into the urbanization pattern, you know it's, uh, it's Bangladesh is already 160 million, 165 around, and uh, population growth is quite high compared to many cities around, uh, many countries around, and our urban population urbanization rate is also very high. And what we observe in recent time that. Uh, not much, not much investment in the rural areas, a lot of unemployment in the rural areas. So people are coming to the cities for education, for hospitals, or for, for medical service, for amenities, for everything, especially for job, people are coming to the cities, the small cities, big cities, and everyone. And rural areas are becoming vacant. So what we see that uh, this is unhealthy urbanization in any way, uh, that has been termed in, in many countries. So cities are crowded and our whole planning system is struggling hard to cope with this, with this thing. So if you want to see the cities in Bangladesh, there's the size. So we have got Dhaka, the big mega city, then we have Chattogram or Chittagong, then Kulna and Rashai. These two are we call uh, mega city. Then we have 
uh, metropolitan city, then we have other cities. So if you consider 500,000 as a threshold population uh, for city, then we have 332 cities in Bangladesh. Then we have uh, a a another like another 500 or 600 small towns. Now, if we, now I'll just talk about how economic planning works in Bangladesh. So for example, the basic uh, document that uh, that uh, I would say that goes through the economic planning is called five-year planning. This is very, in this subcontinent, very popular, where in different sector, uh, the government decide, decides how many investment will go in those uh, sectors. So this is a five-year plan. I'll give an, um, uh, some statistics from our seventh five-year plan, which is for 2016 to 2020. This economic planning in Bangladesh is sectoral. So in 2016, government starts saying that our investment should go sector-wise. And we divide the development in 14 sectors. And for each sector, like I'll, I'll give you the name of the sector in a minute, but like transport is one sector, then um, you have social development or agriculture and all these are different sectors. Then for each sector, we have a ADP, we call it annual development program. The corresponding ministry receives a certain amount of money. Say they decides that for this five-year plan in first year you get like uh, 20 million for this 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 uh, activity. So and then at the end of each year they review it and they see how much they have spent. So then we have MTBF, so midterm budgetary framework. They review the spending and they look into the achievement. So how much we have achieved in this. Every, every one year or two year, then they decide. And uh, this economic planning is a bit uh, top-down approach. We would say that it's very much policy-oriented. So they look into the policy document and commitment. They decide how much we need in which sector, and then they decide. There is no scope to take information, no formal way of taking information uh, from the grassroots level and villages. And it's a non-special allocation in that sense, it's a sectoral. So like transport sector gets this much of money, that's all, it's in that way. But within that way, there is a special bias. We see that big cities are getting more money nowadays. I will show in a graph also. And we also see the overlapping roles among institutes. That's a, a big issue in Bangladesh. The same jobs are doing by different institutes. And, uh, and sometimes they do not integrate to each other. If you want to see that how this sectoral policy works, then we say that we have a Bangladesh um, uh, Delta plan, 2100. Then we have a five-year plan. So our five-year plans are, let me, yeah. Uh, then we have a national policy, commitment, and a strategy. And every ministry has some strategy how they are going to impl implement their, uh, uh, their vision. And for each sector, we have, uh, this type of thing that, okay, this much money we'll spend, this is the strategy and our target is like that. We'll, we'll make five kilometers, sorry, 50 kilometer of metro rail. We'll, we'll construct 20,000 kilometer of rural road like this. So every ministry has a target and then accordingly they make sectoral plan. And for each sector, they have an objective, they have a strategy and they have a line ministry who will implement this. Thing. Now, if you, what happened? Yeah. So if we look into the list of the ministry, we see that we have uh, 14 sectors. These are the thing. For example, I will give uh, the discussion on the few, uh, few sectors which has relevance with our topic. So transport and communication is a sector and there are three ministry actors who implement this thing. Roads and highways, so like highway and bridges, they basically build roads, so the big roads, the highways, but they do not really look into the small road within the urban center and the rural areas. But so, so when you look in, when you evaluate the uh, five-year plan, you see the government is spending a lot of money in transport, but it is really not going to the uh, rural communities or people living in the slum. It's going to the big project like metro, like railway project, by highway project, like uh, you know underpass, tunnel uh, through the river, and all those big things. Then we have a local government and rural development (LGRD) ministry. They spend a lot of money for municipal level, and we also have a uh, uh, housing and public works department and the ministry and there's the housing and community amenities but unfortunately they more they do most housing projects so they 
uh, you know, the land, land. So they take the low land or agricultural land, convert into the residential thing. So if I want to give an idea about the, how these plans are prepared, so we have a perspective plan. Perspective plan says that how can we keep uh, our growth rate quite high as we can reach to the uh, middle income country within 2040. And then we have a national policy, like we have a national policy on transport, national policy on housing and all those things. And we also have commitment. For example, we have a NDC, National De Determined Contribution, where we have uh, Bangladesh is one of the signatory, one of the 196 countries uh, who agreed that we will reduce our emission by 5% by 2030. And uh, this is a mandatory. And then we will reduce another 10% if we get enough financial assistance to uh, to reduce our carbon emissions. So this type of commitment we have, having all those commitment policy perspective, we prepare five-year plan. So which has a 14 sector for each sector, uh, the line ministry receives objective and then they select project and implementation agencies uh, implement those things in these five years. And, uh, and there's a, every two years, there's a budgetary review. So it's like we have a policy for each sector, then we have a strategic direction, we have a project goal and allocation agencies. So for example, in housing policy, it says that improve the slum, do work for the low-income people, and uh, improve coastal housing. For, for example, in uh, slum improvement, they are saying, okay, LGRDC, local government and rural development and cooperatives, this ministry will do uh, <clears throat> slum improvement in, for example, in Shaptira municipality, and they spend like, say yeah it it take one um, 15 million uh, taka for example like this so they set some objective assign ministry and allocate money through the uh, local authority that's a common practice in addition we have a sdg implementation uh, with the five year plan so every five year plan uh, that's the, for this seven five year plan government decides that who will implement sdg so they create a map so it's it's, it's a, i would say it's a matrix i would say for each in this matrix, the functional responsibilities have been given to the different ministry, like SDG 11, for example, making cities and human settlement inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. So to implement this SDG goal, so uh, to achieve this goal, government assigned uh, responsibilities to different ministries to, to ensure that when the poor people get access to the housing and the houses are disaster, uh, not disaster vulnerable, it's sustainable and, and all those things. For example, this is a snapshot of the uh, mapping of the ministry for the uh, target uh, for goal 11, like access to, I have written only three, like access to adequate, safe and affordable housing. So Ministry of Housing, and uh, they will do water supply, they will do slum improvement. Again, access to safe, affordable, uh, sustainable transport. If you look the second row, the middle row, they said access to safe, affordable, accessible, and sustainable transport. If you look into the action, it has listed. It said do MRT, BRT, elevated expressway, a river tunnel, circular rail. All these are very, very big project. Uh, I mean, this tunnel is a corner fully tunnel. This tunnel only can be used for the people who are uh, going through CPAR. I mean, sorry, not CPAR. Uh, the Chittagong Port Access Road. And it can go only, it can travel, it can take people who are going Cox Bazaar, the resort places, and the Chittagong port type of thing. It's not for the small people, but if you look at that, this is related with the goal 11, uh, MRT, only for Dhaka. Uh, and and um, you might know that we have a plan for six MRT, only one is, uh, not one, couple of is working. Uh, MRT six is going to open probably next year. Uh, but also under, under access to safe, affordable, accessible, and sustainable transport, spending money on the big project only, and you don't really see spending on the, uh, you know, the small thing. And uh, yeah, that's the area I want to just focus. So how these things works in the Ministry of Planning. So municipality, they prepare plan and they prepare DPP, Development Project Proposal. They give it to the ministry for approval. Planning Commission evaluates the approval. For example, one ministry said that we want to improve, we want to repair our 
small road which are like two meter wide roads and brain then they, it goes to the ministry planning commission evaluates it they send it to the coordination committee if the project size is more than uh, 500 million then it go to ECNIC. otherwise they approve it or reject it that's the general approach of approving project again we have a big institute like uh, roads and highway who implements big project especially highway project tunnel and bridges they also send the similar thing now, in planning commission is a place where each ministry has a different evaluation cell. So I think I have got three minutes, isn't it? From okay. Um, the, now, now they they evaluate this project, and there is a coordination meeting where uh, coordination committee where they coordinate everything and decide which one should get emphasis and which one will get project. So, but we we see there is always a integration issue because this integration they do at the project approval phase when it is in the ministry when they decide how much money should money should be going and uh, whether this project has a direct relation with the development goal of the country but when it comes to the field for the coordination uh, implementation it doesn't have much coordination first so i'll give you a snapshot of how much you have been spending in the last 5 years in the uh, not 5 years like 2010 to 15 so we see that sectoral allocation and the total allocation is like it's increasing every year and then uh, our um, the sector i'm talking about for the spending for the transport and housing and drainage the spending is uh, also increasing but com compared to the whole budget it is like uh, very very little so this is a spending on the transport sector uh, you might have noticed that 194 and then water supply sanitation is 104. This first row, transport 194, most of the money goes into the tunnel, the bridge, the, the all the big project. Uh, that's the thing. So if you look at the ADP allocation, annual development plan allocation that I have, uh, I have looked into the five years of spending and uh, look into this thing. Um, for you, it's difficult to understand what are those mean, uh, name means. Uh, I'll explain in thing. Rajuk is a, Dhaka Development Authority, the first one. You say the, all the red area, this is the spending in Dhaka. And the column beside it is the other cities. So Rajuk is, uh, is a Dhaka Development Authority, then CDA is Chitang Development Authority and all those things. And if you look at the Dhaka Washa, so it's a water and sanitation, Dhaka spending is high, then Chittagong, then other city. For the small city, we don't have any investment in the water and sanitation, for example. And then we have a LGED, Local Government Engineering Department, they construct road embankment and bridges in the small towns and villages. So they spend uh, nearly the same money that Dhaka spends. So Dhaka spend, Dhaka takes so much money that is equivalent to total spend for the whole country for the rural areas uh, where like 80% like people are living. Now, if I look into the special planning, we have different level of institute who prepare plans for the cities. So like big cities, planning authority is different, then LGD make small planning, and then transport authority makes different plans. So we have a different organization who make plan at the different scale, and always there's a mismatch. I will just uh, go quickly. So our cities are like this now. So high density urban areas, then we have high density, uh, high density cities, mega cities, we have a small town, uh, and and many more things, and our urban development says that they want to have a urban area in the country like this, as you see in the map. The red areas is the highway corridor, so they want to build cities around the highways. So as people get more access, there's a debate that whether this should be uh, developed in philosophy or not. But it's, it's the dream at the moment that has been adopted in the urbanization policy in the country. So what we see that no plan for the rural areas or for the poor, no hierarchy, no integration. So like plans, every plans are isolated, individual document. There is no hierarchy, there is no regional plan, local plan, not like that. Every city has a small plan, no plans. These plans are consulted made. Cities are not making their plan. They are hiring consultants, sometimes foreign consultant uh, from Europe, America, from anywhere in the world. And we prepare plans that are very rigid. So we said, okay, there will be a 10 kilometer road from here to here. And even after 10 years, you have to do this one. You cannot review that thing. So the, the reviewing process and the practice is very poor here. And we have a four stage 
planning that you call that we have been that you have adopted from British practice, which is a strategic plan, a structure plan, urban plan, and detailed area plan. Uh, this type of planning we have, but it's uh, practiced only in the four four or five big cities. So, and Professor the, Kabir, you have two and a half minutes now. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. So, we we are too optimistic in our plan. We plan for big project. We plan for big. Uh, investment project and very often when we review after 10 15 years we see that we couldn't complete even the 10 percent of our purpose project because we have dream our plan is not plan it looks like a dream and someone said that we aren't this someone said we aren't that we in the plan we are accommodating everything and often the poor's are forgotten so they are not uh, placed appropriately in the plan as a result, our cities are like this. In the in the picture, you said the left side is a more it's a gulshan. It's a very planned, nice looking cities. On the right side, this is Badda and all those areas, the scattered, low density, uh, water logging, and all those things are happening. So there's a gap, local challenge. So sorry. So then I want to see that what why this is happening. So why, what is the role of our professional body and what is the role of our education institute and curricula? Then you see there is a gap between local challenge and in the curricula. Our universities are adopting Western curricula. So our textbooks are from MIT, from Harvard. We like to we like to read professors from Harvard, uh, uh, of the big uh, of the big institutes. So westernized, as a result, we have a very westernized view. Textbooks are westernized, approach are westernized, and so as the standard. The standard we are adopting for our road is very wider road because we assume that only every people has car. But in the country, less than 4% people are having car, but we are making roads only for the car. Then we have a big issue in the land tenure. Poor people are living on the vulnerable land, on the railway property, beside the river. The lands are owned by the railway, by the water body. When you go there to construct road, improve road, you cannot do this thing. They said this land is owned by the other authority. So you see there's a disjunct in proposal and the resources. So I say that we need a very consistent strategy to tackle those challenges. So thank you very much uh, for your patience to listen to me. I hope. So, thank, thank you, you very so, much, you. Professor Kabir. I think what you have presented is not only applicable to Bangladesh, but many Asian countries. And the context is, is quite similar because in my mind, I was running through how we approach planning in India and it's quite similar and the same kind of problem. So it was a, it was a very nice presentation. And, and thanks again for linking you know, the big macro perspective of how economic planning affects spatial planning and how this disjuncture is basically uh, leading to ignoring of low income population. Um, and Karen writes, in fact, not so different from UK either. That's, uh, that's another boost to your presentation. So now I'll invite uh, Dr. Anamik Prince from uh, Rabound University of Nijmegen. Uh, Dr. Prince, she is a postdoc in cultural anthropology and development studies, and she'll be talking about a topic which is cycle rickshaws, uh, mobility in Dhaka. And I think a lot of us who grew up in Asia, cycle rickshaw is very close to our heart. This was the only mode of transport available to us as children. And uh, as a transport planner, it really uh, it hurts me to see that their position, their role, their contribution is not acknowledged in uh, any sort of planning, either at local levels or at the national level. So with that uh, emotional note, I welcome Dr. Prince to present. Yes, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me all right. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So thank you. I'm very grateful to be part of this very fascinating and interdisciplinary webinar. Uh, just a bit of a disclaimer before I get started. So um, my background is in anthropology mostly, and probably the vocabulary I use might differ slightly from those of you who have a background in planning. However, I do think that the case I present here today connects well to the broader theme of this webinar in the sense that it explores the relationship between spatial and residential segregation on the one hand and mobility and transport on the other. So my presentation for today uh, is mostly based on my PhD field work, which focused on cycle rickshaw mobilities in Dhaka. And it's good to emphasize that I explored these mobilities from the perspectives of cycle rickshaw drivers, so not so much from the passenger's perspective. Um, my field work in Dhaka consisted of 12 months of ethnographic research carried out uh, between 2015 and 2018 and conducted mostly at so-called rickshaw garages. You see an example of such a garage on the slide. 
And as you can see, these garages are makeshift, often half open storage spaces from where rickshaw drivers rent their vehicle on a daily basis. It is also where repair work takes place and where drivers socialize and play cards after work. Moreover, uh, drivers who do not have a permanent place to stay in Dhaka also often sleep at the spaces. So you can see a little attic uh, over the storage space uh, that is used as a sleeping space. And throughout my research, I visited approximately 75 of these rickshaw garages where I engaged in informal group discussions with rickshaw drivers while also conducting semi-structured interviews that revolved around people's experiences in traffic, their work histories and reasons to move to the city. And in addition, I also spoke to local politicians and urban planning professionals to get a better sense of the wider policy context that shapes rickshaw mobilities. So, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the, the context of DACA, just a, a few a quick facts to give you a bit of an overview of this wider policy context. So recent uh, policy reports such as the DACA structure plan estimates that there are around 500,000 cycle rickshaws operating in DACA. Uh, local newspapers go even further and have in the past described the capital's rickshaw fleets as approximating 1 million vehicles. And the reason for this gigantic gap is that there are no official statistics uh, due to the fact that no new rickshaw licenses or hardly any have been handed out since the 1980s. Uh, and as a result, there are only around 100,000 originally licensed rickshaws uh, in Dhaka and the remaining overwhelming majority so uh, kind of operates illegally in the city, or that is how it is framed at least. And uh, this ceiling on rickshaw licenses is indicative of wider policy attitudes toward the rickshaw, which are mostly restrictive. For example, there are no designated rickshaw stands, and together with other forms of non-motorized transport, the rickshaw is increasingly banned from major roads and intersections. These roads are often referred to as VIP roads. Uh, and these restrictive measures are often legitimi legitimized by narratives that portray the cycle rickshaw as, as inefficient, as somehow backward or as an impediment to progress uh, or even the, the main cause of congestion. However, despite this negative image, the rickshaw continues to play a prominent role in the provision of transportation services and is responsible for 38% of the trips made on a daily basis. At least that was the estimate in 2016. Um, so in this presentation, I will zoom in on a number of rickshaw restrictions that was implemented in a specific area of the DACA, namely the city's so-called diplomatic zone. And this area consists of three upscale, purposely planned residential neighborhoods called Gulshan, Banani and Boridara. And it is characterized by wide rectangular streets, expensive apartments, five-star restaurants, expat clubs, a great number of embassies and a relative abundance of green and open spaces. Uh, this area, which is one of the most expensive areas of Dhaka, is also strongly associated with residential segregation. And this is perfectly exemplified by the third photo uh, on the slide in the corner, which shows the stark contrast between the high rises of the diplomatic zone and the tin shed roofs of the uh, nearby slum settlement of Coral which is also the home to many uh, cycle rickshaw drivers and to many rickshaw garages. And in recent years, this form of spatial segregation has been reinforced by a distinct trend towards securitization. And this happened in the aftermath of, uh, aftermath of two violent events in the area, namely the killing of a foreign aid worker in 2015 and a deadly terrorist attack at one of the local restaurants called the Holy Artisan Bakery in 2016. And in the wake of these two attacks, uh, private housing associations in the area uh, lobbied for enhanced security measures, such as the implementation of CCTV cameras and a heightened police presence. However, this trend also coincided with um, drastic changes to the neighbor's trans transportation system. For instance, the neighborhood transitioned to a bus system that relied solely on air conditioned vehicles. And in addition, check posts were installed at the various entrance points of the diplomatic zone, and rickshaws were no longer allowed to cross these check posts. Instead, only a very limited number of color coded, and this color was yellow, as you can see on the slide, uh, of, yeah, these color coded and properly licensed rickshaws was allowed to operate in the area. So in analyzing these uh, different changes, I want to highlight how residential segregation connects to other domains. 
segregation, I think, is often imagined in the way depicted on the slide, namely as the stark contrast between two different neighborhoods, each representing different socioeconomic classes. However, such an understanding puts too much emphasis on residence as a category and glosses over other forms of urban interaction and inequality. In fact, many of the inhabitants of Coral Slum, uh, for instance, work in the diplomatic zone as street vendors, domestic workers, security guards, construction workers, or rickshaw drivers. Therefore, if we want to understand how the implemented security measures impact spatial segregation, it's not sufficient to look only at residents. Instead, it is important to also look at the ways in which the mobilities and livelihoods of the people who work in these neighborhoods are affected. So this is also in many ways what I've tried to do uh, in my PhD dissertation. In fact, one of the theoretical aims of my thesis was to move beyond a residentialist approach to the city and urban inequality. And here I draw on the work of Guido Martinotti, who has uh, pointed out that the experiences of commuters, workers and visitors are still too often sidelined uh, in analyses of urban realities. And this applies to urban inequalities as well. Uh, urban inequality in cities like Dhaka is often imagined through the rubric of habitation and the conceptual lens of the slum. However, this doesn't do justice to the fact that for many rural urban workers, the city represents a place for making a living rather than a place to live. In fact, most of the rickshaw drivers I spoke to, for instance, did not reside in Dhaka permanently, but would travel back and forth between the city and countryside, and often uh, their wives and children would still live uh, in the countryside. Moreover, many of them were willing to accept a certain level of discomfort in terms of their living conditions in Dhaka, if that meant that they could save up more money to wire back home. So I think that the literature on mobilities and transport has been instrumental in deepening our understanding of urban inequalities by moving beyond realities of urban residence and habitation. At the same time, I think there's still a tendency within this literature to approach inequalities mainly from the perspective of passengers and commuters, and maybe not as much from the perspectives of, uh, of workers. So sometimes there's this disentanglement uh, of mobility and labor. And this is also what um, Rekviashvili and Skipnev have argued. They actually uh, state that transport workers, primarily drivers, are conspicuously absent from the critical mobilities literature. So I would similarly argue that it's very, very important not to overlook the perspectives of uh, transport workers in discussions on sustainable transport and mobility justice. Also because the functioning of urban infrastructures in many cities in the global south uh, relies very heavily on the physical efforts and endurance of workers. Or as Jacob Doherty has argued on the degradation and even the disposability of people's health and physical strength. So um, before discussing in further detail how the mobilities and livelihoods of rickshaw drivers were impacted by the aforementioned changes in Dhaka's diplomatic zone. I want to pause for a moment to think about the notion of the residential neighborhood. For any discussion of residential uh, segregation naturally departs from this notion and Dhaka's diplomatic zone is also often described as a residential neighborhood. However, as is the case for many post-colonial cities, such residential neighborhoods have a very specific history that should not be overlooked. In Dhaka, this history can be traced back to the colonial era when the first purposely planned residential neighborhoods, namely Wari and Gandaria, were developed. And these neighborhoods were created to provide a home to local elites and civilians who were associated with the district administrations. And they were very much designed according to certain British planning ideals, um, such as functional zoning. So this colonial attitude towards urban planning continued to influence Dhaka's urban landscape long after Bangladesh gained independence. In fact, many of these so-called model towns, such as uh, Gulshan and Banani, uh, that were established in newer parts of Dhaka to accommodate high income groups, followed a very similar logic of functional zoning. And as you can see on the slides, they were also very much characterized by this kind of grid pattern of roads. And this embrace of the logic of the residential neighborhoods constituted a very significant break with the way in which Dhaka had developed historically. Indeed, older neighborhoods of Dhaka are characterized by the distinct spatial logic of the Mahalla. 
And these mahallas or indigenous neighborhoods were organized around certain gentry houses or, or occupational groups such as potters and tended to blur the boundaries between residential, public, commercial and domestic functions. And this blurring of functions continues to characterize neighborhoods in Dhaka that have developed more organically, such as slum settlements or informal settlements. However, even the residential pockets of the diplomatic zone were never strictly residential. There are vendors there selling tea or coconut juice. There are rickshaw rickshaw drivers looking for customers. There are small roadside eating spots where workers can consume a quick meal. Uh, however, many of these activities have, been, have faced restrictions due to the new uh, or new, relatively new surveillance um, measures. So, um, in many ways, uh, what happened in the aftermath of these two terrorist attacks in Dhaka diplomatic zone uh, can be described, I think, as an effort to further isolate uh, this area from the rest of the city by making it more and more difficult for outsiders to enter. These outsiders, however, also included people who were actually working in these neighborhoods and often played an important role in its economy. I already mentioned the checkpoints that were installed at the various entrance points of the diplomatic zone. And I think it's quite telling that whereas private cars and motorcycles could still pass these checkpoints, uh, sometimes after being searched or questioned by the police, this wasn't the case for rickshaws. So rickshaw passengers had to cross these checkpoints by foot and board another rickshaw on the other side. This, of course, predominantly impacted people without a private car or a driver. Uh, for instance, I spoke to Bangladeshi uh, staff of some of the foreign embassies who now had to transfer between three different rickshaws when going to work. And the same was true for uh, school going children who go to school in the diplomatic zone, but who do not live there. Uh, moreover, cheap boat services from and to the neighboring slum settlement of Coral were also banned, forcing uh, garment workers, day laborers and domestic workers who worked in the diplomatic zone to take a very lengthy detour by foot. And lastly, these restrictions also impacted street vendors who were increasingly banned from the residential pockets of the diplomatic zone, uh, so the parts where, that were meant to be strictly residential. And uh, rickshaw drivers I spoke with in, for instance, Baridara and Gulshan uh, now frequently had to leave the area to buy their lunch or to consume snacks because they could, not, could no longer buy these things from street vendors. And the same was true for many of the car drivers and chauffeurs that often spent long hours waiting next to the car of their, um, of their boss and, and now all of a sudden had difficulty finding a place to get a tea. So um, the case of the diplomatic zone shows how mobility restrictions and livelihood restrictions go hand in hand. And this is clearly visible when looking at the ways in which the rickshaw system was impacted by these new regulations. So I already mentioned how the implementation of check and entrance point, points led to disrupted journeys for commuters and school going children. However, the new system uh, did not only result in the fragmentation of rickshaw journeys, because what happened was also that the total number of rickshaws in the area was reduced from an estimated 10,000 to a mere, mere 1,230. And all these vehicles uh, were properly registered. And the introduction of these so-called community rickshaws, these yellow rickshaws went hand in hand with a trend towards standardization. So all rickshaws had to be painted uh, in bright yellow. The rickshaw pullers themselves had to wear orange vests and an ID card, et cetera. So this ultimately created a divide between those who were able to get a licensed yellow rickshaw and the overwhelming majority who didn't. And even those rickshaw drivers who did manage to get a license were not necessarily positive about the new system, for they were no longer allowed to leave their designated area and the daily rent that they had to pay for their rickshaw had quadrupled from 100 taka per day to 400 taka per day. Those who did not obtain a license, however, were notably worse off as their daily er earnings uh, dropped significantly. And uh, yeah, with most of the surrounding areas being off limits to regular rickshaws, these drivers now found themselves restricted to increasingly smaller pockets of neighboring areas. At the same time, it was not only rickshaw drivers uh, who fell into economic trouble. The same was true for rickshaw owners, so the people who rent out these vehicles. Uh, they also had been hit hard by the new system. 
most of these rickshaw garages in Corral, uh, the ones that I visited, uh, were full of regular rickshaws that were no longer being used. And although the licenses for these rickshaws were supposed to have the, been distributed proportionately and free of cost among the different owners in the area, in reality, those with close uh, political ties were awarded more than others. So as a result of this imposed uh, rickshaw license ceiling, there was also an emergent black market for licensed rickshaws. So this also connects to uh, the point that this new system predominantly created new income earning opportunities for those with power or powerful connections. And an example that I heard repeated quite often is that the traffic police would on the one hand allow regular rickshaws to enter uh, the diplomatic zone, but would only do so in exchange for a bribe. But at the same time, they would also round up and confiscate a number of these uh, illegal rickshaws on a daily basis. And you can see this on the slide. This is actually a field near uh, the Banani police station uh, in the diplomatic zone. And all these uh, rickshaws have been confiscated. So, Anamik, you have three minutes now. OK, I'm about to go to the concluding slides. Um, so, yeah, just to conclude, what I've tried to do in this presentation is uh, to show how residential segregation connects to other domains. And uh, this, uh, the example of DACA's diplomatic zone shows how a number of security measures and other interventions aimed at isolating and separating this high income neighborhood from the rest of the city should not just be understood as an intensification of the segregation between different neighborhoods and their residents, but also in terms of the impact it has on those who work and move through these spaces. Moreover, I've also tried to underscore that these mobility impacts cannot be analyzed from the perspective of passengers or commuters only, uh, considering that urban infrastructures in cities like Dhaka are very much dependent on the labor and physical efforts of people like rickshaw drivers. So, um, yes, that was uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you very thank much you. again. I'm happy to answer any questions later on. Yes, thank you, Anamik. It was beautiful. And I think you really facilitated the question of whom are we planning for, you know, and the question of power and planning. And uh, if citizens are not facilitated, then who are facilitated? Is it only the rich and powerful who are facilitated? Then it's a big loophole in the system itself. Um, so with that, I would like to invite Professor Sanjay Gupta from School of Planning and Architecture. Uh, Professor Gupta is Dean of Research and, uh, Research and Professor in Transport Planning. He'll be talking about uh, social exclusion and spatial planning and mobility infrastructure. So as we have seen in the first two presentation, there is a strong interlinkage between the topic of social exclusion, mobility planning and infrastructure provision. So with that, I invite Professor Gupta to take over. Thank you, Tanu. I, uh, I'll just share my screen. I hope it's visible. Yeah. It's, uh, so, uh, uh, a very good evening from India, uh, probably afternoon in UK. Uh, well, uh, I am going to kind of take a different route of presentation. I am uh, kind of uh, uh, divided my whole presentation quickly into about four parts. One, I'm going to run through uh, importance of mobility per se in, for urban poor, and then I take it forward towards what are some of the good practices. And then we come back to India, see how, how urban poor in spatial planning and uh, looking at the mobility patterns, what probably are the emerging issues and probably we sum up with some kind of strategies and probably I also would focus some areas where we can probably, uh, you know, go more deeper. That, that is the way I have uh, presented, uh, made my uh, presentation. So, uh, well, uh, if, if one were to look into importance of mobility, uh, well, uh, it goes without saying, high transport costs, uh, impedance to uh, poor, uh, poor's uh, empowerment, access to basic needs and erodes the monetary benefits. Obviously, uh, if you provide better transport, it, it would facilitate uh, poor people's uh, participation in social and political process. I think these are very, very important points. Sometimes we often uh, don't really look into these points in detail. Uh, and urban transport to me has a very, very important potential role in reducing the absolute poverty. I mean, there are, there are uh, uh, quite a bit of research. Karen has been working a lot uh, and, and, and we have been, in our, on our part, we have been, uh, same as Tanu has been working. So, so 
there is a already a, quite a bit of literature which 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 proves that well uh, it it is the mobility which is really the constraint in in, in empowering the urban poor uh, just to look the motorization how it impacts an urban poor obviously journey time starts increasing uh, the cost starts increasing uh, well we are not making commensurating efforts to kind of improve public transport especially for the urban poor uh, low priority to low carbon modes which are which are probably uh, highly highly kind of uh, to be used for urban poor we hardly do any investment for that uh, and and uh, and and so some of these issues i will i will probably take it uh, now if we look up into the global practices and i am sure quite a few of in the audience would be aware but nevertheless for the sake of uh, just looking into them if you look up into bangkok metropolitan areas there are van transit very importantly uh, often in cities we find that it is not really the conventional transport but it is more the informal transit which is actually supporting the mobility of urban poor uh, largely so you have examples in bangkok you have examples in lagos where light brt is probably uh, you know taking uh, uh, people around for you have examples in colombia where metro uh has been kind of doing a great service city of rio where you have uh, uh, you have examples where again it is getting connected to people who are probably not in the affordable areas you have a classical colombia examples where gondola systems are there just to kind of enhance the mobility of poor who probably are disconnected from the you know from the from the mainstream let's put it uh venezuela for example so there are quite a few interesting examples and same way in puerto uh what i'm just trying to bring out that these are not necessarily urban poor but these are mass modes of commuting and when i'm talking about mass modes they invariably invariably tend to benefit the urban poor so that's that's the kind of thing in the what brt started well but then there are issues which i'll talk later uh, that brt obviously was uh, the first interesting experiment uh, in, in in india uh, but then often it has not really served the equity and the inclusivity uh, so to say which it should have uh dar es salaam again you have these shared uh, uh taxis for dal dalas dal uh, dalas uh, uh, in in tanzania uh, uh you have uh, cape town examples guangzhou so you have quite a bit of examples of so called uh, mass commute modes which are doing a very good job uh and let's look into some of the planning efforts so to say uh, uh, across we find curitiba where you have social housing being developed along the rt now this is the intervention where at planning stage itself you are trying to bring in uh, so to say the social housing along transit because that is what is required and we often kind of forget in our spatial plans and master plans that we need to kind of integrate them together there are examples in los angeles where you have 35% of housing near transit points so 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 uh, you know i'm just trying to throw up and i'm sure there would be many more such examples which are there but some of these examples do kind of emphasize that well you need to take you need to kind of integrate uh, the, the 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 needs of the urban poor in in while developing policies and spatial planning uh, for them now uh, a very interesting example i'm sure some of you would be aware the public housing in singapore now probably 80% of the population in singapore resides in public housing and this is the government has taken upon themselves that well we will connect public housing by transit lines now this is what uh the, the 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 government takes it forward that wherever your mass uh, people are residing of not really high income when we say public housing so you you kind of they they are not kind of uh, they're not away from the transit and which probably uh, takes care of most of the problems uh so if we come back to and look up into what is really happening in india well india is probably all of you are aware uh 1.21 billion population second largest country in the world we have close to about 377 million population in 2011 and uh, 8000 towns and cities 468 class 1 towns and 53 metropolitan cities million plus so the huge huge complex and very vast country with lot of urban i mean there there the country is within country you know it, it's 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 of that scale we are talking about uh, uh, the urban population has been estimated to increase to 814 million by 2050 and uh, we are virtually going to be more than 50% from 30% now that is where the whole issues of this will probably get more magnified because you will have special planning uh, for people and especially for the urban poor becoming more and more critical uh, we have 
a slum population of about 17 percent uh, present as per the census in 2011 and uh, some of these pictures one can see and i'm sure this is this is a scenario in any developing country where you don't have affordable housing planned affordable housing this is the kind of picture which normally comes out in, in, in global south in some of the emerging uh, so to say economies and india is no different we have some of the best of the housing projects and we have also some of not so best a kind of quality of housing which is there this is this is the fact uh, which which india is being confronted with and let, let's look into some of the positives now 2015 we had this famous uh, scheme of social housing called pradhan mantri pradhan mantri is called prime minister so pradhan mantri abas yojana housing scheme for for the poor and this was actually supposed to lead to in situ development of slums so largely looking into how to kind of develop slums, create affordable housing in partnerships and pro provide them credit link interest subsidy. So some of the major, major things, and I think this program is really, really going along very well in most of the states. And I think uh, we are witnessing quite a bit of turnarounds, let's put it, in some of these, uh, some of these areas. A uh, lot of focus on basic infrastructure uh, upgradation, and you can even have the incentives for developers. For, for developers who would want to develop uh, such kind of schemes, uh, they are eligible to receive a central grant of Indian rupees 1.5 lakh per EWS housing. So a lot of incentives for, for developers to come and kind of develop these sites in situ development of slums. Also, uh, Delhi, since my, my case would be focused uh, in a while on Delhi, we had close to about 90,000 flats have been earmarked for EWS uh, and slum dwellers to be completed by 2025, not very far away. So the government is actually becoming proactive towards that. And very interestingly, the transit-oriented development policy, which has been announced in Delhi, probably provides a provision for a minimum supply of affordable housing along the transit stations. Now, that is something which is interesting. You have a mandatory EWS FAR of 15% over and above maximum permissible FAR. So, so you, you, the government is sensitive that, well, uh, if you are providing a transit corridor, uh, you need to kind of ensure that in any residential projects coming along the transit line as part of the TOD projects, there has to be a reservation for EWS. Also in Delhi, we have this, what is called group housing, uh, wherein there is a mandatory, again, a reservation for EWS housing to be part of that project. So the government is slowly trying to kind of create this social mix uh, of housing, so to say, so that the poor also enjoys probably the same accessibility advantages, which, so to say, the rich are probably enjoying in Delhi. Uh, I'm just trying to run through some of these uh, policies because this is what is important. 2015, in situ upgradation has been selected, uh, has been kind of, the sites have been earmarked and detailed plans were prepared. And now we are into the plan phase of 2041. Uh, incidentally, 20 year is the perspective for a master plan. And currently, again, the daily master plan has come out with in situ slum JJ cluster upgradation, shared works uh, spaces within the rehabilitation projects, affordable housing schemes on PPP. So you have the private sector participation also being earmarked to develop such kind of projects. Uh, and, and that is what is envisaged. It's not really come up 2041, but then there is a kind of a paradigm shift towards looking into the social housing and how to kind of take it forward. Now, uh, on the other side of it, the negative side of it is the rehabilitation impacts. So if, if any transport projects come in, how does it really impact the urban poor? Well, I'm talking about Metro phase one and we are into now phase four of Metro. We have close, we have constructed close to 300 kilometers of Metro uh, network in Delhi. Uh, and, and we have a very, very high aim of probably being one of the largest metro systems in the world. Uh, in phase one, which was probably the starting around 2001 to 2004, uh, there was a need to relocate about 2,500, so to say, slum and uh, settlements. And they were kind of identified as re resettlement colonies on the outskirts. Now that is what is the buzzword, that most of the time they are pushed out as a resettlement kind of a, a policy. And as a result, what really happened? The work-related distances increased by 17%. The education distances increased by five and a half. The health services distance increased by 
and 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 it's purely the distance but what compounded the problem is the accessibility in accessibility factor so because of the poor public transport these distances actually in terms of commuting time probably increased by many times over now this is what is there especially you are pushing them out and then you are depriving them by a right kind of connectivity and kind of taking away most of the time is just lost in waiting for a bus and traveling in the bus now th these are some of the issues which probably uh, uh, need to be uh, uh, course corrected uh, in fact just example one of the colony call holambi kalan earlier the frequency of users used to be 5 minutes headway which went to 63 minutes so if you are waiting for a bus for an hour one can imagine what is the loss of productivity you probably are incurring in in a, in a in a in a capital city of delhi uh, another example of ahmedabad we i just showed you some slide of ahmedabad brt uh, again while constructing bus rapid transit in ahmedabad nearly 2000 vendors were kind of displaced you know who, who whose livelihood was there along the corridor and 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 there was there were studies available that further 70% of all public housing was built on the periphery of the city and that was that was not really desirable because a lot of land was available along the brt corridor so sometimes the, the point what i'm just trying to push out is probably the planners or the decision makers probably thought that these high value lands along a transit line probably are more beneficial for uh, another high priced value uh, estate development rather than giving it for public housing now this is a this is a mindset of planners which need to undergo a change you know we always look for how much of money i can generate from a property development along the transit and obviously the poor people doesn't figure in into that scheme of things this is something which which probably is 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 a stark reality in a developing countries context i am sure some examples would be available in developed country as well uh but probably the variations are much much lesser and uh, unlike in our cases and here the share of transport cost in household budgets increased significantly for the bottom 50% of the population so one can imagine that there are there are proportionate uh, so to say uh, uh, expenditures which people incur both in terms of time and money some of the mobility patterns of urban poor uh, there was a trl uh, karen uh, study done in delhi uh by david monder uh and and somewhere in early 80s wherein he did some study for jaipur vadodara and patna and to find i'm just trying to push trying to show that well how urban poor really are moving around most of most of them if you if you look up into the trip share quite a few of them are walking quite a few of them are walking and 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 and, and probably they are cycling uh but i think the tendency to cycle has diminished is diminishing in delhi at least Uh, as as cities grow in size you don't the cyc the cyclists get phased out they they get pushed out let's put it because of the compulsions of accommodating the motorized vehicles in the same right of way now this is so 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 these were some of the facts the trip lengths if you can see again the trip lengths are more uh, higher uh, in terms of motorized vehicles but the personalized vehicles if you see the share on the up slide are very very negligible so it's it's actually the trip lengths also probably are hovering around 5 6 kilometers that is the that is average trip length which which urban poor is kind of looking around for 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 employment opportunity uh well uh, we 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 did a study uh, along with my student in 2017 on looking into mobility patterns of slum dwellers in kolkata it's it's probably one of the one of the biggest cities in india and we found that well most of this and we we there was eight slums which were captured in different locations in the city and we found slum dwellers predominantly walk and travel by bus so most of them actually and and when they are walking it's obviously one can understand they're walking for employment opportunities which are existing closer to their location and if they are traveling by bus then that means the locations are probably not within the walkable zone uh 65% are traveling for work 27% are traveling for education trips uh the trip distances normally most of them you will find are 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 quite a few rather are, are just just uh, around a kilometer and so but then we found that there is extreme poor public transport availability and also we found since the slums were sampled based on the spatial distance from the port we found the slum dwellers who were on the periphery of the city probably were incurring more transport expenditure a disproportionate share 
of transport expenditure compared to the slum dwellers which were more closer. And interestingly, we, we also tried to map out how do they move around. So we, we worked out something which is called travel feeds of these people, of these dwellers in Kolkata. And we found, interestingly, yeah, uh, the, I have just shown some sample analysis. This is a master's work. Uh, we found that for work trip, and you can see, uh, for work trip, on average, they're traveling 3.4 kilometers, but they go as high as 7.8 kilometers also. So that is the kind of commute distance they're doing for work. They incur almost 45 minutes of travel. For, so, for Professor maximum. Gupta, you have three minutes now. Okay, okay. Then I'll, 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 the, the idea of this whole analysis was to show that these are the spread. These, these are the spreads where people actually travel. So if the spreads are more linear, elliptical, that means there is a transport axis. They're moving along a corridor. But if the spread is more circular, that is where the, the problem is happening because the, 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 the access is really limited. Same way I did it for, uh, uh, you know, how people commute by bus. You can see uh, the, the, the various shapes of commute, how it is happening. And, and, and obviously, uh, this was all an attempt to see actually how, what are the inaccessibility factors? of these people. People who are along the uh, metro line or the bus line probably have more elong elongated shape of, of, of such zones. But people who are away from the uh, transit lines, they probably are having a more circular, you know, such zone. And that is where they tend to spend more time. So these are some of the things which probably can be used to find out what are these fields for urban poor in different cities? And, and ca can we have policies of mobility by which we can have these fields probably narrowed down and coming more on the transit corridors so that the commute time as well as waiting time can be minimized. This is, this is overall purpose. You can see how, how it fits in. So you can see for walk, they're very small. For, for IPT, slightly big. And this is the field for bus. This is a field for bus. So one can imagine that you know even 20% people commute for bus out of the total probably they spend quite a bit of disproportionate time off there. Some of the issues we found from the slum dwellers, what are the problems? Well, and, and, and you can find that, well, discontinuous footpaths. Okay, uh, you, you, you find some of the high ranking, poor conditions of internal roads, drainage issue, well, which is more of a service and infrastructure issue. Uh, you find long access to public transport, access distance. The bus stops are not closely uh, spaced out, obviously. Availability of alternate modes are not there, you know. And I, as I told you in my initial slides, that sometimes the transit is not the choice. It is actually the informal transit which becomes the choice of urban poor. That is the preferred choice of urban poor. Uh, cycle banning is not really an issue. Uh, we found that cycle banning is not really an issue because for them, uh, either they walk or they kind of use the mechanized modes. So it also depends upon what is the scale and what is the quality of cycling infrastructure. You just cannot have a cycling. Uh, policy until is there is an infrastructure developed which is safer for them to commute. So, so these are some of the uh, issues which we found. Same way we did something in Chennai very recently and another very interesting thing. I just want to quickly sum up. Uh, well, the slums, you can see the accessibility factor, the lowest for slums. They're, they're pretty high for commercial areas access, institutional area access, healthcare, other things. But for slums, they are the poor. So you can see a differential access of public transport across various land uses in, in, in the spatial frame. So, so, so it, it becomes really an issue. Uh, looking into the, the urban CMPs, comprehensive mobility plans, well, uh, you will find that while the terms of reference of the comprehensive mobility plans uh, do not talk about social group analysis, social group appreciation, now this is something which is, uh, which is, which is, which is missing. And uh, some of the most of the CMPs, except very, very few, are not really giving priority to the, the urban poor in their proposals part. Uh, I just want to highlight Chennai CMP, probably one of the one. Chennai is a South India a, a metropolitan city. Probably they are the first comprehensive mobility plan where they have identified for each of the projects what, what is required, which can benefit the urban poor. I think that is only the first of the CMP, which is there, but there are not any such examples in other CMPs. So what are the challenges and issues? We all <laughs> so if you could quickly wrap up, please. I, I'll wrap up. Large scale infra is an issue. Investment in transport is again an issue because it increased land value and thereby it forces urban poor to actually go on the fringes. 
simply trying to increase mobility without addressing transport inequity is not going to benefit the urban poor. Subsidies are welcome, but then these subsidies again are vulnerable to capture by, by the rich. So strategies would be a better appreciation of linkage and interaction between housing for poor and urban transport and transport need to promote land use arrangement in urban areas, which can encourage PT and non-motorized transport. This is something which is important and physical need to improve physical access of urban poor. On the planning side, obviously on the transport side, we need to improve the quality of public transport, provide access uh, in, in those areas by roads and promote a very important NMT role, which is important. And just to sum up, my final slide is, well, I would propose that there is a need to reshape the urban spatial and mobility planning approaches and decision-making structures to better integrate the urban poor needs in order to evolve an inclusive mobility environment. Obviously, the second point I, what I would propose is we need to carry out poverty audit of transport at all stages of project development. We, we don't do that. We don't do that. What is going to be the impact of such development on the urban poor? And I propose just two small areas. How does provision of transport infra and services help the poor gain access to various facilities? There are hardly any works. Uh, Karen may be working probably, but I, I can count these works and fingertips in at least the, the developing countries. I think we need to work more on such areas. How, do, how does transport lead to empowerment to social sectors of urban poor? And secondly, very important, how does prevailing policy framework and regulatory regime will affect the mobility and transport cost experienced by poor? Because I think if we can come out with some research, we can go back to the policy planners and, and ask them to kind of do a mid-course corrections. And that's it. Thank you so much uh, for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gupta. And uh, with that, I would like to invite Julia Nebrija, who is our discussant. She is co-founder and director at Agile City Partners. And uh, they have, she and her company has been working on informal transport quite a lot and looking at the policy level decision making. So with that, I would like to invite Julia to reflect on the three presentations made so far. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate all three presentations and congratulations to putting together a wonderful um, panel. Uh, we really saw from different perspectives that the issues that are facing planning systems in the global south. Um, if I can sum it up, I think that, you know, we saw three main themes throughout. Um, we're looking at planning systems that often fail to include everyone. Um, they prioritize investments over over inclusion. And that was something that the speakers touched on a number of times. Uh, Dr. Kabir, you know, talking about um, uh, the, the, the failure to, to be able to um, look beyond Western curricula, for example, um, and, and uh, talking about being able to only uh, complete plans up to 10% of the original of the original goal. Um, these uh, also lead us to showing how these planning systems don't always set us up for, for success. Um, the, the combination of the bureaucracy and the turn towards, towards Western models um, is, is one of those failures. Um, we also saw about how these systems don't respond to how cities actually develop and grow on the ground. To, to us, you know, especially in the, the Global Partnership for Informal Transportation, that's something that we're very much interested in because what we're seeing is that the reality every day on the ground in these, in these cities of the Global South is, is very different than the, than the response. Um, we're looking at, you know, why is transportation only thought of as a, as a public train or a public bus? Um, and Anemic um, touched on this a lot with her research on the, on the rickshaws in Dhaka. Um, you know, I saw you do air quotes about illegal at several points. You know, they end up being one of the most regulated systems, and yet they're the ones that are often pushed aside, although they're moving the most number of people in the many cities. Uh, we actually call it informal transportation, but can you even call it informal when you know, these are the systems that are moving more people than the quote unquote formal transportation. Um, so uh, I, I think what, what we're looking at overall, you know, in, in talking about um, where are we getting the development models from? What kind of systems are we going to design to respond to how cities actually grow on the ground? Uh, we're looking for that kind of elusive middle ground between the, the bottom up and the top down that we always would like to, uh, to come to. Um, we want to have that control and the bureaucracy that help a symptom system function, but we want to have the agility 
to be able to allow cities to be what they really are and not try to con and not try to uh, design out all the things that actually provide the livelihood that they need, provide the type of mobility that people actually use to go to the market, go to the school, access medical services, access employment, whether that's the trip itself or that's actually using that rickshaw as the, as the employment. Um, we're not looking anymore at just residential patterns where you live in some kind of you know, residential tower and you commute to a CBD, right? Um, I think that uh, that's something else that was highlighted. The type of movement that people actually do on a daily basis uh, might not risk not might might not fit into the conventional transportation planning models. Um, and so, why do we keep kind of forcing something that that might not fit to to what's appropriate on the ground? It ends up excluding people. It doesn't work, and we end up coming up short on targets that were set. Um, perhaps unrealistically in in the first place. Um, so I'm very interested in, in the interest in the the models that uh, were highlighted, such as the in situ um, upgrading, the housing upgrading projects. I think that's a, a model that starts to try to find that middle ground where you're responding to what's happening on the ground. You're including people. You're talking about realistic, agile approaches that can happen in real time. Uh, you're having participatory methods to give people the chance to design where and how they want to live, giving them the access to that financing. And then that is what it starts to inform the larger metropolitan or national level policies and investments that start to give you that more inclusive housing model. We would like to see, you know, how does that might translate in a transportation model as well? What we're seeing that in, in some countries that are, that are, you know, investing in um, cooperatives, uh, transport cooperatives, providing the organizational support and also the financial support to let drivers be drivers and improve that as a service, as a mobility service. Um, in some ways, we've seen that with the, the big tech companies uh, doing that, but we've also seen that, you know, on the, the community level with organizations like Three Wheelers United in India. Um, so um, I think there's a lot of opportunity, and I appreciate that this research is highlighted because one of the biggest challenges is just making this visible. You know, we see those examples all the time from maybe more Western countries. Um, we see the examples from like a, a Copenhagen about mobility or something like that, right? But I also wanna see them about, about DACA with just the same type of vigor and the same excitement and the same vibrancy and celebration. Um, so bringing that visibility to this, you know, to a lot of these sort of invisible, um, these invisible movements, I think is, is one of the, the great first steps. So I really appreciate this forum. And um, there's so much that I actually <laughs> wanted to cover in this in this review uh, everything was pinging as as you were as you were all talking um, but oh my last point is I would just like to say that the you know the pandemic I think you know a lot of this was sort of um, nebulous perhaps to a lot of people who aren't in the sector and don't study this and live this and are passionate about this on a daily basis but during the pandemic I think everyone could really understand how much a city survives on its on its transportation and on its ability for people to move and coexist um, together in a city. So for like, I think, um, and I'm uh, sorry, I'm, I'm butchering your name. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really sorry. Um, but you mentioned about uh, in the residential replanning, the the chauffeurs, you know, no longer being available or having to come from longer distances, and then sometimes people's um, snacks and you know the street food that they used to enjoy was also nowhere to be found. And I'm sure the same with um, Dr. Gupta was talking about people who were relocated or re replanned out of the transportation corridors when the BRT came in. When you were used to having those services and that lively city life along certain areas. Um, that's what we saw also during the pandemic in a very severe way. People, you know, not only could you not access uh, essential services, like, you know, medical workers couldn't get to hospitals. Um, I'm, I'm thinking particularly in my, in my experience in, in the Philippines of the last 11 years, um, you know, what, what happened was, you know, doctors couldn't get to hospitals and, 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 you know, the government agencies were scrambling to, to get together 
uh, services to, to shuttle people around to um, commercial centers, to hospitals, to areas that were frontline services. But at the same time, the very small percent of people who have enjoyed the majority of road space, who are the car users, um, who tend to live in the more privileged areas, also saw for the first time what happens when their, their maids and their cooks and their pedicurists couldn't get to them in their gated villages, right? So I think it was a, a, a very stark example for everyone to understand very, very clearly without reading, you know, um, the very uh, academic, well-researched, well-informed data, you could see on a daily basis that a city needs transportation. It needs a transportation for, it needs transportation for everyone and everyone thrives in the services and the opportunities that are brought by all people who live in cities. Um, and I hope that um, going forward that more of this research is highlighted and we continue to bring visibility to this very important topic. Thank you so much, Julia. That was a beautiful, beautiful summary of all the presentations. And, and uh, thank you for highlighting the implications of COVID and also the gender dimension. You beautifully picked it up because it's, it's primarily low income women who are the hardest hit when they are placed at the wrong locations because the men continue to work. Someone needs to defend for the family, but the livelihoods of women are lost. Uh, with that, I would like to invite Charmin to open up for questions uh, from the audience. Thank you, Tanu, uh, and thank you all the speakers for your nice presentation. It's very actually valuable and insightful as well. And uh, uh, I'm sure we all will be very like uh, like uh, will be gaining so much of information uh, from this presentation. So I would like to open up the question uh, question and answer session. There is a uh, place you can uh, you can write up the Q and A. Uh, so. Before going to that, like uh, I can see some of the question. Uh, I think uh, Karin has asked to Julia. Uh, can Julia say how this affects her own organizational stakeholders in the provision of informal transport services? So this question goes to Ju Julia from uh, Dr. Karin. Uh, yes. Sure. Um, so what does affordability mean? Is that what the question is or the inclusion? I mean, I, I think, you know, yeah, informal so, transport. So Julia, I was talking about the way in which you were talking about these different, um, these different sort of barriers. And I was just thinking, because uh, coming from your own organization, mm -hmm. you know, how that manifests itself from the point of view of the informal passenger organization sector, you know, how, how, and how you're making that visible. So a lot of these issues around housing segmentation, a little bit we heard about this from Anna Meek with the rickshaw driver. So I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit on how you see that within the stakeholders in your own organizational representative representation. That's what I wanted to know, not affordability. Sure, sure. So I think so um, on this, uh, this one project that we have right now with the UNDP, we're looking also at um, at mapping who the stakeholders are and who really needs to be part of this conversation. So I think also it was mentioned that, you know, why aren't drivers included in transportation planning? Um, so, so who needs to be at the table? Um, you know, we, we want to include uh, the drivers. We want to include people who are designing the innovations around tech. We want to include passengers. Um, we want to include, you know, so there, there's a lot of people who um, inform what uh, mobility is and how it needs to look. Um, so I think that's one is, is just talking about who needs to be at the table. And I think also it's injecting the transportation narrative, but also injecting informality in transportation to a lot of forums. So for instance, um, we know that transportation in general and mo mobility, inclusive mobility in general was not very represented at COP26. I think everyone felt that, um, even less so in formal transportation. Uh, we wanna make sure that informal Formal transportation is part of conversations on, on economic development, on the importance of livelihood. Um, of course, it was also touched upon here, the importance of integrating transportation planning with land use planning. Um, so it's really about inserting that conversation in as many forum as we can, uh, such as this one. Um, and and getting that and getting that dialogue out there, and also convening 
um, key players. Uh, our board of advisors is representative, representative of many uh, large transportation institutions. And so maybe they're also uh, integrating informal transportation in a lot of their different work, but giving it its own platform helps to really elevate that as well and, and, and take it from being all these different pieces and putting it in one place. Uh, and giving it a home uh, and elevating its importance. So, so that's, that's one way. Interlink wants to join you. Interlink yes, wants to join you. Definitely. I mean, we have um, some meet and greets coming up uh, this Monday. We have them with Mobilize Your City on the 29th. I'll, I'll, I'll link that here in the, in the chat and um, would love to have you also present during one of our meet and greets and share your incredible research. <laughs> Thanks, Yulia. Uh, Charmaine, you have another question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Julia. Uh, I think Karin has another question uh, to uh, Professor Gupta. Uh, how will it be guaranteed that the housing in uh, TOD or transit oriented development corridor will remain affordable and available for poorer population doesn't gentrify? Um, so, Professor Gupta. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's that's really a very tricky question. Uh, because, because the fact of the matter being that uh, sometimes these reservations, what you do in housing, uh, need not necessarily be actually owned by people for whom it is meant to be. Now, that is that is the risk which we have found in examples in cities in Delhi and other places that you get you get an EWS housing in your name, and then you actually you know sell it to somebody, and then you come back to the same location where you were. So I wouldn't really be having an answer uh, in terms of because the poor would obviously, but again, the point is, if I'm just putting 15%, the 85% people still are in the haves category and not have nots category. So it is the acceptability of these people with the larger set that again, will probably one of the key issue. What are the kind of amenities and social infra is being provided for these kind of people around the TOD zone? I think that is to me is very, very critical. And uh, we still in Delhi uh, or in other parts of the country, we still are have to see a TOD project taking shape. So until as we have a TOD project taking shape, uh, probably we won't be able to answer what are the kind of impacts of those uh, reservations, uh, you know, uh, of those people. This is the answer I can give at this moment. Uh, I think Karin has another uh, part of the no, question. No, no, I, I think, Sharmin, we will pick up uh, a comment, which is perhaps yep. someone can comment on classism and the role it plays when thinking about TOD development that want to implement mandatory social diversity and the opposition of well-off communities to them. And if you have any comments on the cost-benefit analysis that it entails, you know, the economic arguments for development in the peripheries. It's again a, a loaded question and a tricky one, but I think it's important to, to reflect on it. Uh, uh, it's basically it, no. about who is you know, taking decisions. So how does class intersect with decision-making on TOD? The decision actually, if, if one were to talk it in Delhi, the decision has been taken by Delhi Development Authority, which, which controls the land and uh, it is, it is them who provides the guidelines for what kind of development has to come around stations. The land parcels around the stations are owned by the Delhi Metro Rail Corporations. So they will have to probably uh, probably provide a provision for that kind of a reservation. Uh, you know, 15% of the total FSI of uh, built up residential area for, for, uh, for uh, the EWS. Yeah. It is already being practiced for the general group housing projects in Delhi. So it is not that it is not being, it's not around. But well, somebody can argue that TOD projects are going to be developed probably by private sector. So probably the private sector will have to be compensated, uh, you know, uh, for right. so-called loss of revenue. Let's put it that way. So I, I'm sure there are models. I'm sure there are models by which it can, and there are, there are practices happening in Mumbai also where in situ development of slums are being taken up by private developers. So it's not that the models are not really existing. Thanks, Professor Gupta. And uh, with that, uh, do we have more questions, Sharmin? Because I had one question, which actually brings Anamik and uh, Professor Kabir together in conversation. Do we have more questions from the audience? No, and, okay. And no, no, 
then I would actually like uh, Anamik and Professor Kabir to reflect together from your work, Anamik, how can we position the, the rickshaw question on the rickshaw driver question in the big model framework which Professor Kabir highlighted? Like it's going from economic planning to local planning. And, and where should this be positioned and who should be talking for the, the, the you know, informal transport? And, and we can take the case of rickshaws in, in Bangladesh. I would really like reflections from both of you on this. Uh, should I start or do you want yes, to start? Yes, please. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for that, uh, for that comment and that question. Uh, yeah, for me, it was very fascinating to hear uh, Professor Kabir's uh, presentation, also because it was very useful for me to learn more about this whole planning context, actually. And um, I think what resonated with me uh, and with my research on rickshaws is that there's this, this tendency to, to spend money on these kind of flyovers, on these mega projects, on even things like BRT and MRT. And um, that rickshaws are often not, not even incorporated into these discussions. There is rather, uh, an, uh, there's this idea that a rickshaw will gradually kind of phase out from Dhaka. So like most of the planning that's being conducted is restrictive. And also what we see is that um, if you look at kind of uh, urban planning documents, such as the DACA structure plan, there's this idea of, okay, the rickshaw should have this new role. If it is to stay in DACA, it needs to have this role as a feeder service to kind of other modes of transport. And that's of course also really um kind of gives yeah. the idea of the rickshaw as a as a neighborhood service that brings people from their home to another mode of transport but that's not how rickshaw journeys uh, usually unfold people use it very yeah. much as a door-to-door -door mode of transport but for instance. i think anamik that's a really nice point to let professor kabi take over yeah yeah thank you yeah <clears throat> thank you as anamik has rightly pointed out that all the big projects are you know, um, this is it's, it's more, it's creating more social segregation. For example, I don't know uh, whether you have noticed that big projects like uh, the flyover and all these things, these are segregating Dhaka into different parts. And uh, what we are doing under transport planning is that we are restricting non-motorized vehicle movement from one part of the city into the another city. So as a result, so people are not able to uh, move from one place to uh, another place within, even in, within a short distance without taking car or without taking uh, you know, the bus. So I see it's a role of the local government. In fact, uh, uh, local government, whether it can be uh, DTCA or the municipality or the city corporation who should take a very vocal, uh, very vocal role to play. In recent time, there was a, um, the plan for Dhaka that we call DAP, Dhaka uh, Detail Area Plan, and in, in which plan they have talked about the TOD development and all those things. And it seems they've been assuming that uh, everything will be modernized, everyone will have a car or a access to metro, and we don't need a non-motorized thing. And very interestingly for Dhaka, um, the study for integration of MRT is a bit missing. So if you want to see that how this MRT and uh, flyover and all this thing will be integrated with the mainstream networking and the infrastructure, you don't find anything because uh, they have not started looking into this thing. Probably they will start talking about it when the problem starts. So um, uh, Tanu, uh, I have to confess that there is no uh, you know that all solution point that you uh, ask that uh, what, I mean, how, how could you do this thing? It's really difficult, but I think it's the local level planning authority that they need to, and the implementation authority like city authority, they need to take lead, lead role in implementing this, um, you know, the rickshaw and all other non-motorized solution into our mainstream planning. Because if you look at the planning document, there is no presence of rickshaw or, or very little presence of non-motorized and bicycle routing in for Dhaka. Thanks, Professor Kabir. I think that was a beautiful summary and responding to Animek's point that it's missing, that it needs more focus, that it, it needs more recognition of the local context. And with that, I would like to invite Yulia to wrap up because she wanted to comment on it. And a really, really quick comment, Yulia, please. We have maximum one minute. 
Yeah. yeah I, I mean, I'm interested in this because it's like, we keep saying that you know, the planning systems are difficult in these places. A lot of times the governance structures aren't able to actually handle the level of development and the pace of development in most of these cities. And yet we're ignoring all of these solutions that already exist on the ground yes. that are happening yeah. every single day. And so I think it would be really interesting to continue this conversation and try to capture where those middle grounds would be um, so that we can actually see this kind of inclusive development on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks to all our panelists, our discussant and the participants. It's been a pleasure. And uh, with that, uh, Karen notifies us that on December, no, December 9th, there will be, this will be the wrap up session, Karen, right? On December 9th. Yeah, so welcome again on December 9th and uh, see you then. Uh, so we bye will for, have yeah. a panelist at that session from all the previous seminars. So we'll hopefully pull everything together. And Julia, I think that is a great starting point for our panel discussion. We will be trying to think about the way in which all of these bottom-up initiatives could be rolled out, improved and supported further with through capacity building. So it's a great challenge for us. I'd just like to say thank you to all of the speakers today and to Tanu and Sharmin, who have been the conveners of the session, and also to Emma, who is sitting around in the background and does all the work and the hard work in terms of putting the, these uh, seminars together. So thank you all. I hope to see you um, in our final session uh, in two weeks' time. Uh, and it's been great. Really wonderful. Thank you. Really, really, really thank informative you. session. Bye. Thank you. Bye all. Bye.